Okay, welcome everyone. Before we begin, we'll take a quick tour around our presentation room. Please note that we've now turned on the recording function for archiving and playback. You are being recorded. If you're currently using the app, you should find a set of icons. The icon showing two people will give you access to the participant list. The speech bubble will open the chat and the face with a hand will allow you to raise your hand for questions, including asking to use the microphone in the Q&A or to give simple reactions along the way. After the presentation, we'll open up the discussion for questions. You are, of course, welcome to use the chat throughout. A full recording will be posted about an hour after the session ends at cideresearch.ca, where we've gradually been building up the full archive of 18 years of CIDR sessions, and the slides that you see today are posted there now. If you have research you'd like to share with the CIDR audience, we'd be happy to have you aboard, so visit our site for more information and to contact me. And here we go. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the second session of our 2022-23 CIDR session series from the Canadian Initiative for Distance Education in partnership with the International Review of Research in Open and Distributed Learning and the Centre for Distance Education Faculty of Humanities and Social Sciences at Athabasca University. In our opening session in October, we looked at recent advances in a framework for learning at the community level. Today, we'll hear some arguments as to why we may need such advances if our learners are to survive and thrive in our digital world and the new learning structures and relationships that may help them shape their own futures with agency, autonomy, confidence, all the things we hope for our learners. Our presenter today is Jeannie Kim, an instructor in the School of Business at Selkirk College in the beautiful West Kootenays of BC, where she teaches project and strategic management, as well as international business. She's also a doctoral student in distance education here at Athabasca, investigating micro-credentials, a key component of the overall vision laid out in her presentation today. I do want to highlight her recent publication in the latest special issue of the Canadian Journal of Learning and Technology, which digs more deeply into some of the ideas you'll see here, and I'll post a link in the chat. So I'm now passing the microphone to Jeannie Kim, currently stranded in Vancouver, but still in control of her own agency and determined to be with us here today. Everyone, please welcome Jeannie Kim. Thank you so much, Dan, uh, for that introduction. Uh, yes, stranded in Vancouver and for Dan and myself, um, as we know, it's really hard to get in and out of the Kootenays, more specifically trail, uh, this time of year. Uh, but I, I am uh, from trail. And uh, before I begin, I, I would like to first acknowledge my respect um, for and, and deep gratitude to the First Nations of the Kootenai and the Boundary Regions, uh, the Sinex, the Silex, the Tunuxa, and the Shekwekpek peoples on whose traditional territories I am very honoured uh, to live, to work, to play, as well as to learn. Well, let's get started. So the premise of my research um, is, uh, is based on, on change and um, more specifically, I looked at the literature and um, uh, saw some connection um, uh, between hudagogy and education 4.0, more specifically in higher online education. Um, I presented this paper, which is now an article, um, to the GSRC and the uh, Chongqing BNU Athabasca University Symposium last year, um, but I'm still very excited. Um, who's not excited about talking about their research? Um, I'm very excited to share my research uh, with CIDR today. Um, so as I mentioned, um, you know, it, my research is based on change and, you know, change in our environment, um, you know, the way we um, live, the way we play and interact and, and work and learn. So, you know, what are the drivers of these changes? Well, one driver is, of course, the disruption of technology. And so the question I had for myself um, next was, you know, how does this impact education and specifically how we learn and how we teach? 
um, because change in technology is closely linked to change in the workforce. So um, that led me to another question in terms of what skills and capabilities are needed to perform in today's jobs, and more importantly, new jobs that's going to be created. So based on all of these questions, you know, I found that uh, Hudagaji, oops, Hudagaji seemed uh, to be um, one of the practices that links to the skills for the future. You know, skills that address how education needs to change to meet the disruption in the workforce. And so these questions formulated my topic um, for my presentation today. Um, and we see that education is changing. Uh, the way we learn is changing and, um, you know, what we need to learn is changing. And, you know, this stems from the disruption and the technological innovations that are occurring in our daily lives, in our work, and even the way we live. And so my thesis is to discover ways in which we can learn um, in our fast, you know, paced, very ever-changing world. You know, what are those skills needed to adapt and, and manage change? And so I connected Hudagaji, um, to address the needs of the next generation of education, to prepare our students for today's workforce and for a workforce that really has yet to be imagined. So my research question is, how does Hudagaji and higher online education, um, and as well future skills, how do they meet the needs of education 4.0? And so to answer it, I conducted a literature review um, to find those connections um, to Hudagaji, to future skills, as well as to education 4.0. So let's start with the drivers of change, which is the fourth industrial revolution, or as it's coined, industry 4.0. We are already realizing artificial intelligence or AI, the Internet of Things. We have big data, robotics. Um, which creates, you know, what is coined hyper automation as well as hyper connectivity, which impacts how to connect between human and machine, human and human, and then of course machine and machine, creating that instant communication. Now the Internet of Things, also known as IoT, if you're familiar with this term, is about the connection of devices or things to the Internet and as of right now, there are as many as 35, probably over now, 35 billion IoT devices in the world, which equates to about 4.5 connected devices for every person on Earth. So it's predicted by the end of 22, which we're already there. It's amazing how time flies. Um, the number of IoT devices is, is expected to reach 47 billion. The World Economic Forum estimated that 65% of students currently in school will work in jobs that do not exist today. And 47% of today's jobs will be automated in the next 10 years. Um, and more than 50% of the content in graduate degrees right now will no longer be relevant in three years. So this tells us that not only what we need to learn will change, but how we learn. So how is the world addressing these, these uh, changes needed in education? Well, a really great study, the baden württemberg Cooperative State University in Germany conducted an international Delphi survey, um, which is part of the research initiative on future skills, future learning, and future higher education. And they identified 16 skills within three interrelated dimensions. We have the subjective uh, dimension. These are the personal abilities to learn, to adapt, uh, to develop in order to improve a learner's opportunities to productively participate in the workforce of tomorrow. The second um, dimension is objective um, or the learner's motivation, the learner's values, um, the purpose to deal with this new knowledge. And then there's the social dim dimension, which is really the ability to, um, of a learner to uh, utilize their knowledge within their changing uh, social and organizational environments. Now, this report also provided an overview of the drivers of change in higher education. And it identified four 
key drivers which have the potential for radical change in higher education institutions. And they identified two content and curriculum related um, drivers, uh, something they coined the My University scenario, uh, which is really personalized higher education and a focus on future skills. And the remaining two drivers are organizational structure related drivers, uh, multi institutional study pathways, and as well, of course, lifelong higher learning uh, was emphasized. And I'm going to share um, a bit more detail about uh, these drivers in, in my key findings. All right, let's switch to my next concept, which is education 4.0. Uh, and the world, the World Economic Forum defined uh, this new education model, uh, which aims to increase the quality um, as well as the accessibility of learning through innovation, through social mobility, um, and as well as learning through inclusion. Um, it is a response to the disruption and, and the technical innovations that are born from Industry 4.0. And so in their report, they provided a framework that outlined four foundational skills and four approaches to learning that more closely mirrors the future of work. And it takes full advantage of the opportunities offered by new learning technologies. Um, but it's interesting to note um, that of the four skills identified by the World Economic Forum, only one reference technology skills. And I found in the literature that several authors identified this paradox where although digital literacy, technology skills, ICT, um, will be needed to work and live in the Industry 4.0 era, the most valuable skills for the future will depend on the inherent human characteristics, right, such as, you know, creativity and critical thinking. Um, responsive communication and human collaboration. And we see these skills emphasized and identified as well in the future skills report that I showed earlier. All right, so what is Hiragaji, uh, Dr. Blachka and uh, Dr. Haste, who are leading authors in Hiragaji? Uh, provided a simplified list of principles and categories of Hudagaji that explains its approach to learning and the skills and capabilities um, needed. The first principle is learner-determined learning, where the learner is at the center. Um, they're the ones that decide what and how to learn and how their learning should be assessed. Capability refers to the learner's ability to know how to learn, um, use their creativity, be an effective collaborator, and have uh, strong self-efficacy. And self-reflection uh, and metacognition is a very key component um, of Hudagaji. Uh, reflection, of course, is it's a critical learning skill, which is really associated with knowing how to learn or that metacognition. And then we have um, non-linear learning. This is the fourth principle, which ties in with self-reflection. And through reflection, through self-efficacy, through um, you know, their autonomy, learners can iteratively choose a variety of paths to learning. But a significant differentiator um, recognized in Hudagaji is the distinction between capability and competency. And so while Hudagaji recognizes competency as a necessary part of, of having a skill, demonstrating your skill, it raises the importance of the capability to learn. And Nagarajan and Prabhu um, defined competency as having skills, the knowledge, and the capacity to fulfill current needs, while capability focuses on the ability to develop and adapt to meet future needs. And so capable people are more inclined to be creative, uh, to be competent learners, they prefer to work on teams, and mo most importantly, they know how to learn. Okay, so, uh, so here's what I developed uh, in my study. 
um, to answer uh, my research question. Um, so let's begin with education 4.0 learning principles. As you see listed here, I have it summarized here from the previous slide. Uh, we have personalized self-paced learning. We have lifelong student-driven learning, problem-based collaborative learning, and accessible inclusive learning. And so if we match this now with Hudagaji's learning principles, they do closely match to Education 4.0's principles, as well as adding here the future skills report, um, the drivers of change in higher education. So let's start with personalized self-paced learning, which is described as students designing their individual learning journeys. They're gauging their own progression, you know, based on their skills mastery, and they're having flexible learning environments to more closely mirror the realities of work and, and even life. So Hudagaji's self-determined learning is based on the students um, they're owning and they're choosing their learning path and as well their process to learn. And so it is the student who determines what will be learned um, and how it will be learned. And similarly, um, the My University scenario from the Future Skills Report um, describes higher education institutions as spaces where the elements of choices expand so that students can build their own curricula based on their personal um, interests. And it is, it is a very personalized, very flexible, um, participatory mode of learning. Lifelong student-driven learning is where, of course, students have a voice and a choice on how they want to learn and assess when they need to learn. So with the disruptions occurring in the work world, it is necessary for students and for earners, workers to keep up, you know, their knowledge and their skills. Activating, you know, inquiry based and open ended methods of teaching uh, can support lifelong learning. So the principles of Hudagaji, self-determined learning, uh, capability, reflection, metacognition, uh, non-linear learning aligns very neatly with lifelong learning skills. And Dr. Blatchka suggests that the alignment of lifelong learning skills with Hudagaji principles um, is a very plausible, a very meaningful approach to developing skills for lifelong learning. So the World Economic Forum recommends that learning needs to shift from process-based learning, where teachers provide direct knowledge to students, um, they demonstrate the processes and formulas, um, and shifting that to a problem-based approach where students are assigned to collaborative projects. They try out multiple solutions and iterations to solve problems. Um, Hudagaji's nonlinear design allows students to be iterative. Um, they, um, they are allowed, uh, it allows them to revisit their potential solutions um, and come up with you know, ways to improve or adjust and the future focus skills emphasize going beyond the knowledge acquisition and include the complex problem solving, dealing with uncertainty, dealing with change, uh, being agile, being creative, all of which are capabilities needed in Hudagaji and problem-based collaborative learning. And finally, accessible uh, and inclusive learning it is just that um, learning systems do need um, to shift towards more uh, accessibility, more uh, to be more accessible and therefore more inclusive. Um, methods to ensure access to opportunity for, for everyone is, is very vital. Um, multiple modalities for learning, such as visual, um, we have audio, tactile, kinesthetic methods can be integrated um, into uh, existing curricula to help students engage in the material in different ways. So how does Hudagaji align? Well, online learning um, considers the integration of emerging technology into its theory and practice, right? So the relationship with Hudagaji is that it is considered a potential theory as a way to integrate emerging technologies, which can provide you know, the multiple modalities for learning. Um, the networked university scenario uh, from the Future Skills Report 
Um, this can also increase accessibility and inclusion, you know, shifting to that multi-institutional model where institutions can share innovations together um, to learning um, as well as, you know, sharing um, innovations um, and, uh, and resources to teaching. So this allows students a much broader range and flexibility to choose not only what they want to learn, um, where they want to learn, um, but of course, when uh, they, they want to learn. Um, so I mentioned in the beginning of my presentation that the premise of my project was to look at change in education. And Lester Davis and Stuart Hayes um, use a metaphor of the river as a way to describe how change is so rapid and dynamic in all aspects of our lives, so much so that, um, that education has become, as Davis and Hayes assess, totally inadequate. Um, so I'd like to conclude my presentation with a quote from Davis and Hayes. Um, who actually wrote this 22 years ago, but I find is, is still so true today. It is a world in which information is readily and easily accessible. Disciplined based knowledge is inappropriate to prepare for living in modern communities and workplaces. Learning is increasingly aligned with what we do. Modern organizational structures require flexible learning practices, and there is a need for immediacy of learning. Education 4.0 is a call to action for educators to prepare learners for the complexities that are happening now and are bound to be complex in the future. So my final question to myself um, that I have is, you know, what are those expanding possibilities? Uh, well, you know, I have so many grandiose plans and I have um, several research projects lined up that focus on answering um, this question. And I'm currently completing a manuscript on uh, micro credentials as, uh, you know, I believe this is the next progressive step uh, to investigate how educators can prepare learners now and in the future. So this manuscript is going to look at uh, specifically um, at the relationship between industry and education and how this partnership is deemed uh, vital to producing and delivering education that meets the needs of both the learner and the employer um, in our very changing work and education world. Um, and then from there, um, I have this wonderful idea to actually do a, um, a project, a research project that matches micro-credentials and pedagogical um, practices and processes. That's it. I, I want to thank you so much for attending today. Um, to access uh, my presentation, uh, references, you can use this QR code or this link. Now, I'm told because I have it in Google Docs that you need a Google <laughs> um, account. So just rather than going fancy, I'll just make it really easy. And here's my list of, um, uh, of, of uh, presentation references. Thank you so much. All right, great. And uh, thank you, uh, Jeannie Kim from Selkirk College uh, on Hudagaji and Education 4.0. So at this point, we go to Q&A. Uh, we're a relatively small group here today, so I think everyone can feel comfortable just grabbing the microphone and perhaps turning your camera on uh, if you'd like to ask a question. You're also, of course, welcome to post your questions in the chat. Uh, just a reminder that the slides that you've seen today are available for download uh, at our site, site cideresearch.ca and we'll be posting a full recording uh, there in about an hour or so. So uh, if anybody has any questions, by all means, go ahead. Um, if I may, I would like to start with a comment because um, I found your presentation just so pertinent and topical to where I presently am right now. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm also fascinated that you're at a college because I am too. 
and um, the my role there is one of instructional designer. Um, and I'm it's the programs offered are very um, um, in, industry based and community based, but they are largely academic. And I've been interested in quite a while about micro credentials, as is the college I'm working with. Um, and so when I saw what your presentation was about, I knew I had to attend <laughs> um, because college is where I see a lot of the questions that you've raised being actually played out sooner, perhaps, than in the university arena. Mm -hmm. And I agree. Um, one of the programs that I'm presently reviewing and looking at is a very, um, it should be a very applied program, very academic. And I think that, um, like I agreed with, with Lisa Marie on your conceptual framework, that, that was actually quite beautiful because it, it, it put everything together, like it lined everything up. I like, I like tables and stuff. Um, and so my comment, and I really appreciate, is I really appreciate presentation. Um, I'm just kind of curious for the college that you work for, um, like are micro credentials a thing? Like, are they happening for your college right now? Um, not as fast as I'd like to see it. Um, there are some pockets of micro credentials at Selkirk College, but they're currently more geared in more that trades and industry programs. Um, not and I and I work in the school of business and I see I, I see the skills and capabilities and the competencies that um, my students need to go into the work world. We we have a, I, I think we have a, a an okay curriculum, but I think it could really be enhanced if we took a skill or certain skills and really honed in into that and, and put that in a micro credential where we're, you know, where we can um, not only um, assess their ability to apply those skills in a very, you know, more condensed, shorter time frame, have them demonstrated in, in ways that are more pro project based, you know, bringing in, in an industry leader as an example. Um, to come in and, you know, literally try and apply these skills. But the other part is, and again, looking at it more from a pedagogical perspective, if we lined up many micro-credential skills, and if my students are already in the workforce, whether, it, let's just say, part-time, that they noticed, I need some more skills in communication, that they are still part of that program, right? But they can go in, take that micro-credential course, very small investment in time as well as hopefully potentially money. But they're the ones that are choosing what they need, whether it's their employer that's saying, you know, Jeannie, I, you know, I think you need to work a little bit more on your communication skills or, you know, take that micro-credential course in the School of Business program. That's what my, that's what I'm envisioning with, I would love to see in community and regional colleges more specifically, Leanne. Um, universities are so bureaucratic, they're so big, but I think for us in, co in colleges, we have a bit more capability to be able to maneuver around, you know, that, that bureaucracy and, and be able to present, you know, a, um, a full curriculum program that that can meet the needs um, of, of the student of, um, uh, of industry as well, too. So that's kind of my dream. <laughs> and that's why I'm going next to micro credentials and looking at that through the lens of pedagogy as well, too. Um, mm -hmm. Yes. But thank you. Thank you so much for your for your comment. And I, I don't is micro credentials happening in your institution yet, Leanne? No, it is spoken of frequently by the dean, mm -hmm. and I am I am a cheerleader in that regard. I believe that they play a role since there 
like for all the reasons that you mentioned, like for example, let's take project management, which I know is one of your areas as you introduced yourself, and it mm -hmm. is presently in this course uh, program, sorry, that um, that I'm helping to to prepare. And but project management doesn't stand still. And it needs to be be addressed in an applied manner as opposed to an academic manner. Agreed. And the skills could change given the technology being used. I have no idea, but all that I do know is that the system needs to be more flexible and more open to to change um, that doesn't require however many iterations and proposals that you have to put to get through a um, a Senate or like a um, academic Senate or or whatever body approves <laughs> curriculum. So um, uh, I I'm probably going to be um, following your research, which I uh, will be um, because of what I sense as the direction that you're going in, which parallels the direction that I am going in. So thank you. I have no more questions other than that, I don't think. <laughs> thank you, Leanne. Yes, thank you, Leanne. And uh, yeah, no, thank you also for bringing up uh, the, the sort of the the relationship between Hudagaji and uh, community colleges and the potential there, um, you know, mm -hmm. community colleges often being um, a way for for younger learners to kind of shape their their path into um, perhaps a larger program at a university, you know, beyond what they do in the college as well. Uh, I think that's a really interesting uh, area to explore. Okay. So is there anyone else who would like to uh, perhaps offer a comment or ask a question? We have a couple of um, couple of notes in the chat, uh, you know, offering up uh, uh, examples of micro credentials at BCIT and uh, and discussions, ongoing discussions about them. All right, so Lisa Marie, you have your hand up. Yeah, Jeannie, I just wanted to tell you I really, really enjoyed your presentation, and I think you did a, a, a really wonderful job of, of, of presenting what hoidagoji is and the connections between hoidagoji and future skills and, and why it's so necessary that, that our students have those skills. And, and uh, um, you know, in all the years that I've talked about hoidagoji, it's, it's not always been that people really get it, and you get it, and I think that's, that's oh. great. So, thank, so you thank you so much. <laughs> <laughs> well, I got this all from yeah. you. So, <laughs> have you have you spoken with Stuart at all? I know he would be thrilled to see your research. So, um, I will pass it on to him and let him know about oh, the thank, session. Thank you so much. I would love to yeah. uh, have um, uh, Stuart um, have uh, Dr. Hayes take a look <laughs> at what I've what I produced as well. Too. Yeah, I was very mm -hmm. um, very close and intimate to both of you in my research and. Um, yes, thank you so much, uh, especially for attending today, Dr. Blaschka. And thank you for validating the fact, at least I, I, for sure, that I was on the right track, <laughs> uh, but that I represented, uh, you know, your work and your research, um, hopefully as accurately as you were hoping for. You might also want to reach out to, to Dr. Ellers because um, he's yes. doing much more work since that time on future skills. Um, it's it's a and I think he's also moving into the area of micro credentials, so maybe there might be an opportunity for you to collaborate in the future. Who knows? Oh, possible. thank you for that. If that's kind of my next that that's where I'm going to next is really focusing more on what's coined, you know, skills of the 21st century. And it's it's all great and fine and dandy that we have these these wonderful whether they you know, some people are calling it generic skills or calling it soft skills, and that that's fine. But you know, how do we how do we integrate that into into how not only what we learn, but how we also teach it, right? So, um, you know, I'm, I've read on some bit more older studies from 2015, 2016 on it, and I'm really more interested in looking at at how that's going to, you know, how, how we can get these skills um, in, into our education curriculums, into our programs. Okay. 
uh, well, we do have a couple of more hands coming up now. So uh, Eugene, Eugene, would you like to grab the microphone? Yes, thank you. Uh, what a wonderful presentation and integration of difficult concepts. Thank you that I haven't seen this done this way before and I appreciate it. I do want to ask you a little bit more about, uh, I don't know their names well, Nagarajan and Prabhu 2015, Prabhu. competency versus capability. You, you offer some nuance there and I thought maybe you could tell us more about the difference between the two. It seems to me one is learner centered and the other one might be broader than that, might be group and institution, but I'm not sure. So could, could you tell me a little more about those items you they seem mm -hmm. to be pivotal yes for sure and it was it was a a, a little bit of an eye-opener discovery myself of course through dr botchka's um work um and, and looking at the difference between competence or competency and and what capability is and there's lots of research and papers out there that that have this debate on the differences when we think about competency though and what i really loved about um nagata um Ju and and well, prabhu and Nagata. Anyway, <laughs> you know which, <laughs> which article I'm referring to. Um, what I found so interesting about their paper um, was that they were able to express a, a very tangible and even, um, yeah, very tangible difference between the two. And and you know the English language. I mean, we could, um, you know, we we have so many words to say, kind of say the same thing. But what I really liked about their positioning with the difference between competency is 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 that when we think of competency, when we think of a skill, for example, communication skills, and we blow that up a little bit to understand the competency, which is how we apply, how we actually, you know, um, use that skill, that that communication skill. You know, we might need, you know. Um, uh, other, you know, other skills as part of just communication, interpersonal, um, yeah, you know, for example, um, clarity, tone, all of these things that really then say, I have the competency to be a good communicator. Um, and that's something that we can use right away. And, and uh, the authors, you know, state that the competency really does talk about if I have a skill in communication, I have competencies that I can actually use today. Um, uh, and build and continue to build my competency as a good communicator. But capability looks at what um, uh, what an individual needs to do in the future. So it's taking that skill and that competency that we have right now, and we're going to continue to build and hone that to be able to take on any challenge or any um, uh, environment that we're in, take that competency as, as, as a good communicator and be able to quickly adapt, be able to be agile and take that competency and now become capable in any situation, in any environment um, that I can use my competency and skills on anything that can come my way in the future. And that's the big difference. And that's something that I'm, I'm seeing even with um, uh, with and trying to build with with my students is that's great you've got good communication skills you're very competent but what are some of the things that that you need in order to be capable to be able to hold on to that that skill and at any given environment because it, the world is changing so much how can I adapt how can you adapt your communication from email to now social media writing as an example so so that's um uh, that's the difference, well, how I explain the difference uh, between that, Eugene. Thank you for your question. I hope I answered it. Thank you. Great answer. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, no, that would also seem to have some uh, implications for assessment as well. A different yes. you know, different strategy, different, different philosophy of assessment that would be tied into that difference. Um, so thank you, Eugene, for bringing that up. Okay, so the next one on our list is Peter. Peter, do you have a question or comment? No, I don't know. <clears throat> big question or a big comment or a mix of both. Um, this is really exciting for me to be here because I get these invites from CIDR and I have for the last 15 years because I was doing a master's of education and they've just kept coming and I'm a software background, but I'm also an educator. 
I've spent about 10 years out in industry now, and I haven't taught for a long time, but I've just recently started teaching again in the computer science realm, and I'm a program head for a college out here in Newfoundland. And and I just to see the title of Hudagaji in just a public type presentation for me came as a real surprise because a lot of the work I did in my master's degree 15 years ago was really focused on the self-determined learner. So I'm super excited to have seen that diagram that was so beautifully put together to really do the self-determined stuff and, and this whole idea of capability and competency. Like I've got two teenage sons and I'm always talking about, you know, the, their capability and their competencies. And it's really future driven or what you have in the present, which is fantastic. But one of the gifts I also had was I worked on the Mozilla Open Badges project over 10 years ago. And actually, I think I presented in Decider 12 years ago about the Open Badges project. And, and one of the things that I'm curious about is where do I get good information about micro-credentials? Because it seems as though things have matured in the last 10 years, which I, and I know that the program on program head, we inherited, I inherited this thing that they call the subway model, which is very much using micro-credentials where, where you can get off the subway at any stop along the full journey. And each sort of semester, should give you enough micro credentials to have a competency to have skills that you could use to jo join the workforce or not and you can continue on the subway and in fact maybe you discover two semesters in that you're not meant to be a software engineer but you're meant to be a software tester mm -hmm. and you can change your subway line but you still carry those micro credentials with you so for me i'm in this place which is like i'm going back in history from my learning perspective but then bringing all the software development experience that I've got, I could get into other projects. But that's really, I'm mostly have a curious because like what is exactly is the definition? Like how do you define a micro-credential? Because I know from the badging perspective, we had like the, there was these micro-credentials and then the credentials kind of bubbled up into a slightly bigger cluster of credentials that would then become, I guess, like the equivalent of a diploma or something. And I'm mostly asking as a question, like, where would I start my journey of some of the places of what defines a micro-credential and what the state of micro-credentialing is almost as it would relate to a traditional diploma or something? I hope that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, it it totally does. And I hear you. I and I am more than happy to share like all of my research with you, Peter. Um, mm. I have been researching my credentials now. Well, as soon as I finished my Hudagaji papers, I call it, um, and just yeah. been concentrating now on on really understanding micro credentials. So I do have a plethora of resources to help you. Um, as oh, I wow. mentioned earlier, I, I'm also almost finished my manuscript and would be happy to share that um, with you as well. Um, but to answer one of your questions, you know, what are micro credentials? And um, oh, yes, thank you for that. Yeah, for sure. BC campus um, has um, there's a lot. If you're looking for uh, Canadian um, information, absolutely. Campus Ontario, um, they not only um, have a, a few really great um, reports, but they actually have even put together a micro credentials guideline for um, institutions as well as industry um, to to build um, and create micro credentials and all of the you know the guidelines and requirements and their recommendations. But um, but to, you know first of all you know what is micro credentials? Well it, it, you know in in my research and in the literature and most especially the reports there really isn't a universal <laughs> universally agreed you know definition or even spelling of micro-credentials, to be honest, um, <laughs> right? So, you know, there, there's so many authors out there that describe micro-credentials um, as alternative credentials, alternative, you know, digital credentials, digital badges, um, nano degrees, uh, micro masters, MOOCs, right? Um, and and so the, the definitions of, you know, micro-credentials in, you know, in the literature tend to describe, you know, really one of two variations. So, a course uh, or a credential. So micro-credentials as a course 
are described as very short, verified um, course, or it's a learning experience with a digital certification, like with your Mozilla Open Digital Badges um, work that you did, right? It has to have that digital certification, that validation that someone has completed something with an assessment, uh, assessed of their assessment of their skill. Um, Micro-credential courses are, you know, they're generally available online. They provide um, learners to complete the course asynchronously. So they have all these wonderful accessible um, accessibility type of, of characteristics and features. They're learner centered. You know, they're um, it, it, of course, requires self-determined learning. Um, it's there, it can be very collaborative, very interactive type of courses. Um, but uh, on the, the other type of what we call micro-credential is actually the credential, which is just the proof of learning outcomes that a learner um, has acquired from a short learning experience, it, it, and it has been assessed. And so we can look at micro-credentials as two sides of the coin, either as a course um, or, um, or as an actual credential. Um, so hope that hope that helps with your with uh, kind of defining micro credential. It's very, um, uh, you, you know, uh, um, Australia and New Zealand um, they're quite advanced now in, in micro credentials, making that definition. Europe, most especially, um, have uh, the European Union have you know put together a, a very um, comprehensive uh, approach to micro credentials. They're actually wanting it to be transferable. Um, they want it to be, uh, to have credits. Um, and they're looking now as like what, you know, Ellers and Kellerman had in, in, imagined, which was, um, uh, which was having that open university type of concept, right? Where yeah. you can take a micro-credential at one university in one country in, in Europe and then and then go, you know, maybe you you um, find work in, in another country and then you can continue on and, and still build your, you know, build maybe towards a degree. I mean, that would be so fantastic. So interesting. No, this yeah. is super helpful. Thank you so much. You know, I thank I, you, yeah, Peter. I look forward to to following up on this now that I'm sort yeah. of officially and professionally back into the teaching community. It's oh that's it's really wonderful. nice to be back. And yeah. it's uh I'm glad that there's these sort of events. So thank you. Oh, thank you for attending. My my email I think is in the presentation. Please feel free to reach out to me at any time. We'd love to share my research with you. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. And welcome back to Cider, Peter. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> nice to have someone uh, back from the uh, the early years of, uh, of, the, <laughs> of this. This this has been going on for a long time now. Oh uh, yes. Started by yes. Uh, Dr. Terry Anderson uh, back in the day. Yes. So uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, wow. All right, and yeah, no uh, micro credentials. Uh, we've we've been looking at it in relation to um, the global south, and the role that they can play um, in supporting uh, learners uh, in the global south who may be patching together um, larger programs, really from uh, various regions of the world. Um, we do offer some MOOCs for them as well, and uh, so yeah, no, that whole area. I mean, we have we have had some conversations with the university about possibly, um, you know, finding some way to make that work for the MOOCs that, to, that Athabasca offers as well. So, you know, there are lots of opportunities there. Um, definitely, definitely a, a, an interesting research topic. OK, so we do have a, a few minutes left. Is there anyone else who'd like to? Uh, ask a question, raise raise a comment, um, anything at this point. All right. Well, I, as we were talking before, um, before you you began your presentation, um, you are in your doctoral program now, and uh, you are doing uh, a, an interesting approach to it not the conventional um, dissertation structure. Mm -hmm. It very much uh, involves um, research um, and uh, and publications. So perhaps you'd like to talk about that and uh, how you see that as, you know, perhaps related to um, a, a hudagogic approach of your own. 
Oh, that's actually a good twist. Thank you, Dan, for that. Yeah, instead of doing your traditional dissertation, there's, of course, an opportunity um, offered at Athabasca University, as well as I think a, a lot of other education institutions, to do a manuscript style dissertation. And I guess essentially what that means is I do need to have published work and maybe one at least two, I believe, and then maybe one more in the queue being peer reviewed um, as part of my research. And I, I found um, that by doing a manuscript style, there is, of course, a big risk because, of course, I need to be published um, as one of the criteria. So, you know, I can create all these and write all these wonderful manuscripts, but if I, if I can't get them published, that's kind of one of the, the biggest risks. But um, one of the things that really <clears throat> hit home for me, which was in was which was in my very first course in uh, the doctoral program, uh, who was facilitated by Dr. Aga Palalas. And she said something really uh, that really integral to me. She said everything that we do as as um, researchers is is to contribute something back into the world. It's it's not just you're doing research and writing and getting published. There's there's a a much bigger important value there, and it's it's having the ability as researchers and as as published you know and have your research published is that you're doing this to share something uh, with the rest of the world. Maybe even to yes, thank you, Wendy. Maybe even to make change. You know, it doesn't necessarily have to be big global change, but you know, maybe making a change in in other researchers and other um, you know, students, right, giving them a different perspective, you're putting together all of this wonderful work and putting together your findings and your research and then, and then even just offering, you know, just a very, you know, maybe just a, a very basic model like I did with in this um, particular project. Um, but, you know, it's, it's another perspective and that really hit home for me so much so that, I felt that all of the research that I want to do, I don't want it to be in this big honking dissertation, <laughs> you know, that's 200 pages and you know what I mean, Dad, like, sorry, I don't mean to discount it. Although, you know, it's, it's still, it's still, of course, very, very valuable, but I, I, I had so much um, interest in so many things on my first launching pad was, was Hudagaji with Dr. Blachka coming in, um, in our 801 course as, as one of our guest speakers It really, really inspired me. Um, to be able to really take a look at, at, at really at education in a different light, education 4.0, our changing world, all of that. There's so much that we could talk about. So that's, that's kind of where my, uh, what's driving me and the fact that I, I want to talk about not everything. I mean, I'm going to be very focused, but, um, but I think there's some really critical things out there that are happening today right now and some things that have been developed um, you know, over the last 10, 15, 20 years, for example, Hudagaji, where we need to bring this up to the forefront and say, there's some good theoretical um, uh, theoretical practices and processes, some good theory out there that we know in distance education and online education, but bring that together into something that's happening right now, like micro-credentials, as an example. And, you know, because MOOCs, MOOCs have been around for over 15 years, right? Where and you know it was a it was supposed to be this huge promise of of you know changing education and and you know really it's still there and I think it's still very very valuable. My credentials is the same thing. This huge promise that it's going to change the way we learn and change the way that you know that uh, that we teach. And so I really want to try and bring that up to the forefront as as much as you know just just me can. So thank you for allowing me to talk about my my future uh, research. Dan. Yeah, no, no, that's great. And, and, and yeah, no, I, I mean, it just it just seems like you're you're walking the talk there when you're you're shaping your own um, dissertation to to, you know, I don't know, have that connection, as you say, that connection with the world. So, <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, for sure. <laughs> oh, thank All you, right. Dr. Blatchka. So thank you, seeing... everyone. Seeing, uh, yes, definitely. Thank yous coming through the uh, the chat. Um, long message here from Sarah. Okay. Thank you, Sarah. Okay, great. You're also from the Cooties. That's wonderful. Beautiful yes. place. 
Well, and you know, the Kootenays has has a, a history of you know sort of unconventional thinkers um, with its uh, both you know the Dukabor heritage um, yeah. and the um, the draft dodgers and so on. People wanting to shape their own lives. Um, so yes, it's it's I don't know. Perhaps it's in the air. Yes, or the water maybe from the Columbia River. <laughs> there you go. Hey, Dan? <laughs> sure. There's no, oh, that water is clean, absolutely clean. It is. All right. Okay, so if there are no further questions or comments, uh, I will remind everyone that uh, you, the slides that you have seen um, uh, today are available for download um, from our site, ciderresearch.ca, C I D E research.ca. And uh, you can also catch the recording of this. We'll post that in about an hour or so. We just have to make a conversion and then we'll have it posted on our website. So I do want to thank everyone for joining us today. And of course, thank you to our presenter, uh, G.D. Kim from Selkirk College. Thank you so much for having me, Dan and everyone. All right. And with that, I'll turn off the recording.